Welcome to Beat Diabetes. We're going to be talking about the four basic glucose style rises and asking which one of these four styles does does your blood sugar fit into? How does your glucose rise after meals? And of course, that's what we're talking about is after meals. It is a well-known phenomenon that when we eat, our glucose rises. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing unnatural about that. Of course, it will. But if it goes way too high, that's a real problem. And there's four basic patterns of how people's glucose can rise, and we're going to talk about them, starting with the glucose rise you get when you're young and healthy and everything is humming along perfectly. So let's say you're 20 years old, you're fit, you, uh, you run regularly, and you're not very heavy. So your glucose rise will look... A little bit like this, and uh, this is going to top off at around 125 to 130 when you eat high-carb meals. If you eat low-carb meals, it, it won't even get that high. And the other issue that to be aware of is that it'll be back down in an hour's time, sometimes less than that. So you eat a meal here, you bump up to 125, 130. And you almost immediately head back down, depending on what you eat. If you eat more fat and protein, it may take a little bit longer to get down. If you eat mostly carbs, it'll take not so much time to get down, but it'll get down fairly quickly. So within about an hour, sometimes less, you'll be back down to your baseline level, which is probably going to be, that's a very poor eight, 85, 83, 80, with some young people, it could even be in the upper 70s, but it's going to be in good shape. Now, <laughs> if you're diabetic and you understand fully that uh, how, how glucose works and how your own glucose works, you may say, well, that's just incredible. How could anybody uh, do that well? And the answer is uh, there's two factors that you got going for you when you're, when you're bumping up to 125, 130 after a high-carb meal and you're quickly back down into the 80s. Number one, chances are you're young. And number two, chances are you are slim. And uh, when you've got youth and slimness going for you, uh, you're in pretty good shape. And uh, we could wish we could get back to that. There may be some young people that are overweight and not in very good shape, and they may not even see this hardly ever in their youth. And the problem with most young people is though they're getting these amazing results with their glucose rises, they don't even know it because they never test their blood sugar. They don't even think about blood sugar or diabetes. So, you know, they've got a perfect pattern of glucose rising and, and diminishing, and they don't even know it. So, you know, kind of sad, but that's how it is. That's how it was when I was young and so forth. That is number one. Ideally, if you could stretch this out for a while, uh, that would be perfect. So, yeah, it's one thing to get this when you're 20 years old. It's another thing to have this kind of glucose response to meals, and especially higher carb meals, when you're 45 years old. I think that's possible or something close to it if you can stay healthy, stay slim, and exercise some and don't overdo the carbohydrates. It, it's possible. There would be some, not a lot, but some in their 40s that would have that kind of a glucose rise. Uh, for most people, it's not going to look like that. And that brings us to glucose rise number two. So glucose rise number two is going to look something like this. You may have a pretty good baseline level of blood sugar. Maybe you're in the 90s at this point, uh, maybe 95, 92, uh, something where your doctor would not be very concerned. Generally, if you're under 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter, your doctor is not going to be too concerned. But when you eat a high-carb meal, you're going to bump up way high, uh, I say way high. It wouldn't be high compared to some diabetics. But let's just say you're up there somewhere close to 200 milligrams per deciliter. So that's not good. But the one thing you've got going for you is that you will go back down quickly. And that's how I was when uh, I first started having breakdowns in my metabolic system. 
I would bump up high, but I wouldn't stay up high very long. And there's a lot of people that do that. And the thing of it is, when you bump up high, but you get back down quickly, you're still likely to have a pretty good A1C score. You're still likely to have a pretty good fasting glucose test. So your doctor is not going to, chances are he won't even know about this. And he's going to check your A1C and he might check your fasting glucose. And he may say, well, you've got a fasting glucose of 93 and you've got an A1C of 5.5. Uh, looks to me like you're in pretty good shape, but you are headed for trouble if this is your case. This is not normal. This is not the way it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be back with the first glucose rise that I showed you, and that is where you've got a gentle rise, never gets above about 130, and is quickly back down. In this case, you're still quickly back down, and it can fool you, especially if you don't do glucose post-meal testing or postprandial, as the official name is. If you don't ever do that and you just go by your A1C or go by your fasting glucose, you may assume everything is well. The problem is when you're going up this high, number one, that's not good for you at all. And you can get diabetic complications even though you're not diabetic. Let me say that again. You can get diabetic complications even though you're not diabetic. How do I know that? That's what happened to me. I was having diabetic complications. I was having something similar to rheumatoid arthritis. I was having frozen shoulders. I was having irritable bowel syndrome. Uh, and my glucose was, was bouncing high, going low, and yet my A1C wasn't bad. It, it wasn't diabetic. So this is like the next step toward diabetes. You're not there yet, but and your doctor may not even be worried. You may not be worried, and I think this is the case with a lot of people who eat vegan or vegetarian, and they do fairly high carb, and they will talk about how, well, my, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm just doing fine. My A1C is 5.3, and my uh, fasting glucose is a 91. I'm doing fine. So the third glucose pattern looks something like this. You eat a high-carb meal, you rise high, 200, 250, 300 milligrams per deciliter. The problem is, unlike scenario number two, you stay high for several hours, and then you slowly make your way back down. So you're in this danger zone, damaging your body with high glucose, and your pancreas, if it's still working well, and in most cases with type 2s, it is, it's still working well. But it's huffing and puffing its little guts out to try to keep up with this high insulin. And you're doing that at almost every meal. And oftentimes when you have a snack, you're going up way too high. And here comes your insulin to try to chase down your high glucose, huffing and puffing your pancreas, trying to keep up. You're wearing out your pancreas, plus you've got an issue known as hyperinsulinemia. Your body is loaded with insulin. Hyperinsulinemia means hyperinsulin all over the place in your bloodstream almost constantly. And you're going through your day and you, you no sooner start to come down. This may take you three hours, sometimes four hours to get down. And uh, here you go with another meal and you go right back up. And this is going to be reflected in your A1C. This is not where your doctor says, well, your A1C still looks pretty good. Your A1C will look terrible at this point. So you may, have, you may be rising up to 200, 300, 400 milligrams per deciliter, and your A1C may be 9, 10, 12, very high. And your doctor says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you are a type 2 diabetic. You have serious diabetes. And this is what your pattern is going to look like. Again, usually the pancreas works, but it just can't handle all the insulin, uh, the need for, for uh, so much insulin. I, I like to call this metabolic inflation. It takes much more insulin than it ever used to. When you were young and you had that first pattern where you just bumped up to 125 or so and you were back down in an hour's time, uh, that's when your insulin really worked well. But now inflation has set in. You know, when I was a school teacher in 1977, my first job as a school teacher, I had a contract for $8,000, and we lived off $8,000 for a year. That was my yearly salary. I think in the summer I did do a little tutoring and made a little bit of extra money, but not much. 
Now, how in the world could we live on 8,000? Well, the answer is we couldn't today. But in those days, things didn't cost as much. Cars didn't cost as much. Rent didn't cost as much. Food didn't cost as much. Everything, if you could pay prices of, for 1977 products today, uh, you'd think you, know, you were in great shape. So I could stretch out 8,000. Now, even in those days, that wasn't much. <laughs> I, I was not uh, living very high, but, but we made it. Today, inflation has set in, and it cost so much more. Now, I know some of you Africans are saying, well, if I could get $8,000 per year U.S., uh, I'd be doing pretty good. But in the U.S., you don't pay what we pay in America for food and for gas and so many other things. Well, that's kind of how insulin resistance works. It takes more insulin than it ever used to take. Inflation has set in. It's going to take you five times as much insulin, perhaps, to deal with your high glucose levels. And even then, they can't keep up. So this is going on. And this is when your A1C starts to go, get out of control. Often, it can happen overnight. You may think you were doing well because you were in scenario number two. And scenario number two meant uh, you were just spiking up and, and dropping down pretty quickly. But now you're in number three, and that just doesn't work. It is, uh, this is a problem. And you get all kinds of symptoms and diabetic complications and uh, neuropathy. You've got to pee all the time. Your eyes go bad. Sometimes you, you get bleeding in the eyes. All kinds of things go on with this scenario. In fact, some of them are going to go in with number two. But this one will really do you in. So glucose pattern number four looks like this. This is what happens. This is what happens to your glucose rises and spikes when you adapt with a low-carbohydrate diet and you cut out the bread and the pasta and the starchy foods and the sugar, by all means, cut out the sugar. And you end up with something similar to the first glucose pattern you had when you were in your 20s. The one difference, again, you're, you're just getting up to 125, 130, maybe not even that sometimes. But the one issue that is probably not going to be identical to the first pattern is it's probably going to take you longer to get back down than it did when you were 22. Uh, you're going to eat more fat and protein. And although you will not spike high, eventually, now at first you may still. So if you're running a glucose levels of 300, don't expect you'll be down to here, you know, in a week or two. But eventually you'll drop down almost almost certainly you'll drop down. And eventually you will likely get to this point where you don't hardly bump over 130, just like you were when you were 22. You didn't bump much over 130 when you were 22. You don't bump over 130 now. You say, well, wow, I, have I regained my youth? Have I drank from the fountain of youth? Well, not exactly. It'll take you a little bit longer to get down. You are, after all, 70 now or 65 or 58. You're not 21. So it's not going to be identical to when you were in your early 20s, but it's going to be a whole lot better. And this is where complications recede. If you can just control your spikes and get to this kind of a place by eating low carb, by eating more meats and more salads, and high-fat dairy like cheese, like heavy whipping cream, and you stay away from most of the carbs, and what carbs you do eat are very low-carb, like a garden salad, like some broccoli, like some uh, cauliflower with cheese over it, perhaps. This is likely what, where you'll get. This is where I am. I hardly ever bump over 130. In, and in some ways, I'm like the dentist of... 22 years old, maybe better off in some ways because I was having problems even in my 20s. I was in pretty bad shape. It'll take you a little bit longer to get down. And some people may complain, well, you haven't beat diabetes at all. You don't have the functionality. You don't have the glucose rise that you had when you were 20. Uh, yeah, that's true. But by adapting, and, and this is the key word, adaptation or adapting by adapting to the new reality and that's we all face that in every possible way a, 
uh, a wife loses her husband. He has a heart attack and dies, and now she has to learn to live as a single woman. She has to adapt. Uh, your children grow up and move away, and now they're all over the country. You have to adapt. Life is filled with adaptations, and uh, this is an adaptation. It's kind of like wearing glasses. Most people, when they were 15, they didn't wear glasses. Most people, when they're 70, they wear glasses. So you adapt. You don't complain and say, well, I'd, I, I want to do it just the way I did when I was 15 or 18 or 20. It's just not going to happen. Let's face reality, my friends. So we adapt and we get a glucose rise like this as our norm. And if you're only eating two meals, which is what I do and recommend, if you're only eating two meals and your, your first meal of the day is simply some uh, butter, coffee with butter and cream in it or butter and coconut oil or, or some kind of fat that uh, doesn't raise blood sugar at all, so you've only got two meals to deal with and those two meals look like this for your glucose spike, you can't help but end up non-diabetic. You cannot help but end up in the fives club. You're going to get an A1C in the fives, almost certainly. Benedict and I do have another YouTube channel besides Beat Diabetes. I'm talking about our Bible teaching channel. On this channel, we usually have three different types of Bible studies posted every week. On Mondays, I do a video devotional, which is a short talk about various Bible topics, normally lasting about eight minutes. On Thursdays, you can see Benedict and me sitting around our dining room table studying the Bible together. And usually, a couple of other days in the week, we post audio podcasts. There's no video connected with these. They are strictly audio only, which means you can listen to them as you go for a walk, drive in your car, or prepare your meals. There's nothing to look at, but plenty to hear. So check out our Bible YouTube channel, which goes by my name, Dennis Pollock. A link to this channel is in the description.